Hello everyone and welcome to another episode in my Realism Overhaul series in Curl Space Program 0.23.5. In this episode I'm going to try and do what I said I would do which is to send this which was the first module in Pratchett Station over to the moon and instead of using the awkward and hefty Dillinger Heavy I'm going to employ the Forsetti launcher, an old favorite, with uh, of course adding a bit of fairing in here. Size, we need three meters, so we're gonna have to pull the same trick, I think, using the inner stage. Uh, yeah, we have to do it like this, and so yeah. I'm going to send this over to the moon and hopefully, hopefully, we will have our first permanent satellite around the moon. And that will help us to do many things of a exploratory nature. And perhaps we should also add some scientific instruments to this while we're at it. Because when it's got to be orbiting, it might as well do some science while it's at it, right? So what we have... You know, we... I can't for the life of me remember if we've done goo containers over the moon. How heavy... Uh, I, I should check that. How heavy is this thing? So we've got... Once we get there, we'll have uh, life support and stuff. So if for some reason there's a moon mission with... A um, crewed moon mission with an emergency they'll be able to dock to this and grab that but I'll have to remember to put this particular docking port on to any such mission 1.9 tons well that's pretty much the limit of what this particular launcher the four city can send to the moon especially since this doesn't have any sort of well it does have thrusters of its own I take that back but that's basically, actually that's probably less than what it needs to get into lunar orbit. This can, the launcher can launch something to the moon, but it can't get into orbit with that. Hmm, so this might even need to be heavier. I think I need to look into ditching some of this life support stuff. Let's see about that. Um, I don't strictly, uh, for emergency purposes, it's not necessary to have the water purifier and the carbon extractor. And those are 0.6 tons together. So if we could extract those particular things. Oh, right. So that's good. That looks proper. And now we have enough delta V. Barely, though. Maybe I should boost that up just a little now that we've uh, shed some mass. So perhaps a little bit fatter on this part. So what would I name this particular satellite around the moon? Well, we haven't done Clark yet, have we? Okay. Ooh. It's not quite a geosynchronous satellite, which would be more in keeping with Arthur C. Clarke's legacy, but uh, this will do. Okay, just wanted to check with Werner von Kerman here on what we have and have not done. And I'm especially interested in the mystery goo. So we've done high over the moon and near the moon, and it doesn't look like that's biome dependent. And as far as other stuff. Gravity scan obviously. I think uh, on the moon gravity scan we've got quite a lot of stuff already. But it looks like this high but we keep hitting the highlands and midland craters. Maybe with uh, satellite we'll be able to hit more specific targets and we seem to be missing just above the highlands which should be relatively easy to get. And... Maybe... Uh, there, there must be more than just four biomes, so... I guess we could probably find some more there. That's not dependent... That's not dependent on 
EVA report, well, obviously, we'll have to carry a Kerbal for that. Crew report, yeah. So, mainly, we can do some more gravity scans. So, alright, let's, let's add a, a detector for that. Now, obviously, putting it into a polar orbit would be nice, but I'm not going to think too much about that. I'm going to add two of these just to balance them out. I don't think, mass-wise, they're not that big a deal. They're a bit of an issue on cost. They're actually, for some reason, um, uh, if you add three zeros to this, a million dollars a piece. So, that's sort of weird, but, okay. Alright, so that's our probe, and we've got more science on it. It's pretty light. And actually, we can probably boost its delta V even more. Oh yeah, let's make it a 1.9 ton craft. This should easily be able to do that. That's only 1% of its launch mass. Is that? No, the temp, that's... Oh, bad day for me. How can it be only 1% of its launch... Oh, right, to the moon. <laughs> I was thinking about the... The usual three to four percent for low Earth orbit, but uh, this is actually this is way above that, isn't it? Well, it's because this stage burns part of its fuel up in order to get into orbit. Okay, so seven thousand seven hundred. This will have to burn a thousand eight hundred. That's fine. It's actually carrying too much fuel, and we have no way of relighting it. Ah, that's an interesting point, isn't it? The ullage motor is a thing. But it's very, exp I mean, it's very hefty. It's we'll add a ton to our mass if we use that one. There are KW rocketry ullage-ish rockets, but we don't have those here right now. I guess we'll have to unlock them. Scriptable control system. Ah, that's that's dangerous stuff. Uh huh. So and of course, if we add the stretchy SRBs, they tend to be knocked off. But perhaps they won't be knocked off if we add a decoupler and a cone to the top of them. I guess this is the time to check that out. So let's say... Alright. So we've got one here. Now I attach. Now they're all better. Okay. Hopefully that will be enough to to ensure that we can keep things going properly. All right, so that'll help us relight if they stay on. Okay, as much as I hate cone shapes uh, because they've got a slight degeneracy on this edge here and technically on the top of the cone. That's, by the way, why I like egg shape better. It's just topologically better in every respect. But, uh, but yeah, we've got a cone and we're just gonna have to deal with it and that's because the way things attach here. So, um, I've never gotten the egg shape to look quite right for this sort of thing. Final check. Let's make sure that our fairings drop off at a decent place. Probably around three minutes into flight is about right. Okay, no, not mech jab. So, after those decouple, after that lights here. Okay, so that's good. Lift off thrust is good. That should continue fine. Okay, I think uh, we're all set. So, this launcher, hopefully, can deliver a two-ton payload to the moon, and that's what we intend to do. Let's... Hope I didn't forget anything. And take this out to the launch pad. Okay, as we see the tanks fueling up here. Got a lot of aerosene and N204 to put in. Uh, let's take a look at our situation with respect to the moon. Let's 
So set as target. I'm just gonna do that thing I did with MechJeb, which is to look at the rendezvous planner and see when to launch. I think it should be safe to time warp this thing. So hopefully. So let's just wait until the relative inclination is zero and then launch. Um, that might take a while. I hope it won't be in the dark. Uh, we're crossing the dark side here. Oh, my little satellites. Look at them go. I have to admit, part of the reason I've decided so far not to deorbit some of them, even though I think that they have enough RCS to do that, uh, is because I sort of think there is an aesthetic quality to having all these up, even though it might cause me problems later on. Okay, this is close enough. And we just have to go 90 with this. Okay, it'll stop showing me that stuff. Everything's all fueled up. We've got electric charge. All right, uh, let's get throttle up. SAS on. And so the launch of the Clark satellite to to the moon, to lunar orbit. All right, long time since I've been to the moon in this series. And we're off. Those loud, solid rocket boosters going away. I have added AeroCam to this install. I just haven't put them on the rockets. I should start doing that. Though I sort of want to make the first thing I want to do with the AeroCam be to put them, put it on one of the rovers. So I want to land a rover on the moon and play around with AeroCam using that. But we'll see about that. I tell you, every launch is like me going, have I forgotten anything? Like pretty much all the way up. And here we go. I'm sure that's the way it is for a lot of people. Okay, so far so good. What does far say? Nominal. Okay. So yeah, it's interesting in my uh, EDB series, the Mission Control, the one where I do it all cinematic and use Telemachus to control the rockets. Uh, that series, I have to be aware of the fact that actually four minutes in-game is more than four minutes real-time and so for the first two episodes of that I cut out parts uh, creatively in order to... Uh oh aerodynamic failure. Uh, did we lose... Uh, okay let me see F3 Jump between cryogenic tank and stretchable SRB. Okay. And then decouplers. Okay. Okay. We've launched the rocket. We'll just have to deal with that now. Anyway, as I was saying... Uh, the, so I, use, I cut out parts in order to make sure that the staging matched the timing that it's supposed to be. So for the Saturn 1H rocket that I launched in those videos, I have launched in those videos so far, the first stage lasts four minutes. In real time though, because of the lag, the video is usually around seven minutes. 
So in the first two videos I cut out parts and the third video you'll notice that the launch looks faster and that's because I actually sped up the video. Okay, I should have been I've been talking away here. Uh yeah, I sped up the video. So Okay. So that's why the launch looks faster there. Bad launch for me here as I was occupied with other thoughts. So we're crossing Mach a little bit l l high, a little bit late. But I think I can deal with that. It is not the biggest problem on my mind. The biggest problem on my mind is the fact that I don't know how to relight the third stage and and even while I was talking about making the other videos I was thinking about that too so yeah, editing those is a little bit of a trick and uh, speeding up the video means that it takes more time to render it so it takes more yeah, processing time. Every little effect adds processing time and that's just another one. Okay. So yeah, I'm recording this on the day after the SpaceX Dragon version 2 reveal and I think my reaction is probably the reaction of pretty much everybody who plays Kerbal Space Program which is how do they fit everything in there? I mean, uh, how how does it all fit? I, I would love to see the schematics on that particular capsule uh, and all the juicy details because I don't know how it all fits in there. And and it's like they've they've unlocked TARDIS technology for those who uh, watch Doctor Who and it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Yeah, it really reminds me of Doctor Who's for that reason but yeah so we've got this Dragon version 2 I gotta say the seats look a little bit dinky I, I hope they're nice and comfortable for astronauts in big spacesuits I mean they they looked barely enough to fit Elon Musk uh, his normal self but uh, a full astronaut in a spacesuit I don't know but it's nice to see it I think a lot of people have got to get a lot of ideas with this. Certain millionaires and billionaires might want to become space tourists. Uh, the whole Soyuz experience might have shied them away, but this Dragon version 2 sure looks like the, the sort of like the iPhone of, of space vehicles. Uh, just like the iPhone sort of revolutionized cell phones. And uh, it sort of has that sort of different look to it than previous capsules just like the iPhone had a very different look and functionality to it than previous cell phones alright here we go and second stage is lit okay and we can probably drop the fairings here okay that's fine and extend the AIES antenna. Yes, that's extended. All right. Just a little problem with the nose cone, but that's that's to be expected. There it goes. Don't collide with anything, don't collide with anything. All right. Now, I suppose the thing to do would be try to minimize the relative inclination. Let me just check which direction it wants me to go in. Okay, go south a bit. Are we in a position where we could do a direct burn to the moon. Again, relighting is my question. And the answer is no.
No, we can't do a direct burn to the moon from this position. Yeah, I guess they must have had a sort of press kit or press information on the Dragon version 2 capsule. I'll have to pick that up and take a look at what details they actually give in that. Probably not much. Uh, one of the reasons I imitated SpaceX's press kits with my own little uh, press kit for the EDB series was because it actually had very few details. I mean, it had, it had all the normal details for launch. But compared to the kind of details that NASA usually offers in its press kits or has offered, especially in the older press kits, it was like a huge volume. Uh, those were much more involved. Obviously before making my own I decided to take a look at various examples. But yeah, hopefully it has some more details. Three D printed engines is good though. I like that very much. I think that is a definite sign of the future. And in particular it'll really help if if Mr. Musk is serious about colonizing places. Those places could uh, benefit a lot from being able to reprocess materials into whatever parts they need and to do so on the fly. It's probably more efficient to send raw materials to a place if necessary, like titanium and stuff like that. I don't know. I don't think they'd be able to find titanium very easily on Mars, for instance. But it'd be easier to send that stuff to a place raw than to send the finished product. The finished product takes more volume, so just send a 3D printer to the colony and the raw materials and everything's good. Reusing a pod is another thing. The the, the, the other pods do look quite beat up once they've finished re-entry and obviously the heat shield is I guess they'll just replace that but yeah uh, determining the stru structural integrity of a pod after re-entry seems like a costly thing I don't know how easy it'll be to refurbish it for the next launch these are all very very big questions on my mind and the problem is with space with space flight it takes so long to wait for all these questions to be answered it's like ultimate delay of gratification you have to wait years before finding out whether something like the SLS might work might find out I mean we managed to go to the moon with a pretty quick delay a pretty, pretty quick gratification on that uh, takes much longer these days it seems of course uh, the situation with the Apollo program was different for so many reasons oh, by the way just as a curious point uh, with the Saturn 1H launches the video has to be sped up about 1.4 times during the first stage about 1.3 times during the second stage 1.2 times during the third stage so that gives you an idea about how much lag I have when doing those particular launches with that rocket so that's how much so really on average you're talking about each of these launches takes about 1.3 to 1.4 times the actual so if it's a 12 minute launch nominally it actually takes more like 15, 16 minutes. Actually, maybe even 17 minutes real time. Which isn't bad. I mean, of course, uh, we've got a serious example of lag with stuff like EJ's space shuttle on Twitch. Uh, his fully stocked space shuttle takes what is it, 40 minutes to get into orbit? And that's around Kerbin. 
real time. That's 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 testing the limits of this program, folks. That is. Okay. So here we go on this stage and I don't know if we'll ever be able to relight it in order to get our little satellite to the moon. We'll try. So if I can get the vertical speed to pretty close to zero just as we're getting our periapsis pretty close to where we want it to be, I think I can get this very circular. Okay, pretty good. 246 by 237. Not bad, but now comes the tough part. Okay, uh, it looks like a very convincing moon encounter. We don't intend to come back, so there's no points with the any sort of return trajectory. We just want to get as close as possible. Well, actually we don't want to get as close as possible. I take that back. We need this a little bit loose so that we can communicate with... If we're too close, then the horizon problem starts to be an issue. So we actually need to be fairly loose. Um, though we don't have to be excessively so. I think that'll be good. There's a concern that if I'm too loose, I won't be able to get into a proper orbit with the delta V I have on the... but I, I think we've got enough delta V for that. We'll, we'll aim for this and we have to wait 49 minutes and as you can see I am currently pitching up full and this is how much turn I get from it. So that should be very interesting as far as trying to use our turning ability to get this whole thing started. Fortunately I put on the stronger RCS ports on the top but I don't know if that'll be enough. Okay well I really should have stopped time warping a little bit earlier than this and I've got to turn on RCS. Oh okay turning is not bad. These RCS ports are quite nifty. I presume we'll be close to the prograde vector, indeed. And uh, how's fuel flow? Stable. All right. So that's that's one thing. Well, let's not uh, delay. Let's go. All right. Time to get the solar panels out, I think. So this big dish will again be devoted to any sort of long-range missions. We don't need that for short-range missions. This should contact Kennedy Space Center directly. Yeah. It has a range of 400,000 kilometers, so it should be able to maintain communication from the moon. And perhaps we should uh, set the other one for the other space center, but perhaps we should set it for the, one of the geostationary satellites. Let me, I'll have to take a look at what sort of dishes the geostationary satellites have free. Uh, somebody pointed out uh, that I can set these things to active vessel, but of course since this is a relay satellite in the first place, I can't set this one to active vessel. That wouldn't be quite right. This has to relay stuff, uh, 
one of these dishes can be set to active vessel for for the moon missions, but the the ones that are trained to the Earth and the Earth orbit satellites will have to be dedicated. Maybe I could use the main dish even for the for Earth communication purposes instead of one well, of the smaller ones. And of course, really it's not necessary for a long-range mission to communicate with this satellite around the moon, though it might be a good backup. Maybe that this one should be tuned to active vessel. Yeah, I think I like that idea. Let's have this one be tuned to active vessel. Okay, I'm gonna have to shut this down at the right time. Uh, okay. Oh, sh come on. Ah, uh, time delay. Ah. Uh, okay, well, I'll let it spin a bit. Um, alright, whatever. Uh, yeah, I've got a 0 0.41 second time delay. Okay, so how is our approach? Uh, a little bit loose. Alright, uh, activate RCS. Let's stabilize a bit. Try and aim for prograde. Okay. Just backing off using the RCS. Okay. Seems to be giving me very different pictures. I think I better go in a little bit closer than I at first intended. Okay, let's say 500 kilometers instead of the 2,000 kilometers I had originally aimed for. And it looks like we might end up going retrograde, which is fine. That's fine. Alright, RCS off. Time delay. Yes, I have to remember that. Now we've got 1,500 meters per second left in this stage, so I'm not going to dump it yet. Let's see if it can help us get into orbit. If so, then the fuel on the satellite itself can boost it into a more proper orbit, depending on what we might want. So yeah, that, that's fine. So, all we have to do is get over there. Our electric charge is diminishing, but that's because we're on the dark side. Let's see what uh, this says. Uh, battery current, three days. Not bad. Gen, drain. Is this something we could turn off? Probably the lights. Yeah. Just turning off the lights is sufficient to make everything stable. So that's good. Uh, yep, let's do that since this is just a transit to the moon. Alright, we don't need this anymore. And let's get over to the moon. Actually, you know what, maybe I should uh, sort out my communication a little bit better than I have. I think uh, GSTAT2 will be the one I want to communicate with. And I'm going to set GSTAT2 to... Well, let, let's see if GSTAT2 has a spare dish available. before. I... Oh my god! GSTAT2 just disintegrated. It just fell to pieces. I'm not joking. It just disintegrated in front of me. These are all GSTAT2 pieces. We've got random. We've got a. We've got a gravity-like situation. And for, of course, it's in uh, geostation, geosynchronous orbit. But what the heck happened? Uh, F3. Structural failure on linkage between service module and inline reaction reel. Structural failure between the. Maybe it's the corporal sustain. But then this happened first. The corporal sustainer really uh, has been changed in stuff, so but uh, it should have been the same. It shouldn't have been a problem. Oh uh, well, these are the sorts of things, crazy things that are going to happen now. Uh, 
glitches. So this, well, I mean, a glitch is a glitch. Uh, now what we have left? It's only got two minutes left. And it's not got any way to reclaim charge. It's just gonna die. Okay, so... Yeah, wow. Just disintegrated on me. Solar panels flying everywhere. Space junk galore. This is... <laughs> okay, well, I'm not going to be able to look at any of my satellites anymore. Um, what's going to happen with my space station if this sort of thing is going to happen randomly? This is a problem. Okay, well, let's switch to Clark for City and hope it doesn't disintegrate on me. Okay, well, this one seems to be alright. I don't know what happened with the GSTAT 2. GSTAT 2 is a new one. I haven't updated any mods since I launched that, did I? I don't think so. I think that was a recent launch in our revamp, uh, our attempt to fix up things. So that's a little bit troubling. If it was one of the oldest launches, then I wouldn't be too worried because that would mean that maybe some update caused some glitch that led it to disintegrate like, like that, but the fact that it was launched after all the mods were updated, uh, it's troubling. But we will proceed and now I think I know what I'm gonna do. Uh, I can't look at any of my other satellites except perhaps, perhaps, the should I dare try and look at the station? I could aim this dish, uh, or this one, at at the sta at Pratchett Station, and have Pratchett Station communicate with it. Why are there two of the? Oh, one of these must be a spent. Why would it be able to communicate? Oh, now I'm really worried about stuff. Okay, um, right, M2, far one. All right, well, I'm gonna risk it. I have to know. Uh, no, I, I, I don't need this to do anything. I need to switch to Pratchett Station to see what's going on here. Okay, so this is the legit project station. Okay, so let me change its name so that I don't get mixed up with it. Rename vessel, project station. Okay. So yeah, let's let's just have one of its dishes communicate with the Clark permanently. And then one of the Clark's dishes can communicate with this permanently. Okay. Now I'm really nervous every time I switch vessels. Uh, I know some of you will tell me just not to switch vessels like uh, from the map view and just go back to the tracking station, but you know, I've got to be able to do these things. I wonder what that is though now. But for now, I'm not going to check up on that. As long as I know Pratchett Station is alright, I'm, I'm good. Best not to have things randomly exploding. Now here's a fact. Every time I switch vessels to this one, uh, for some reason, something lights for a few sec. It, it just it uh, I get the sound of a burst of thrust, just a tiny little burst of thrust. But you'll notice that my moon periapsis is now 500 kilometers from where it was, so so it's not a fake burst of thrust. Uh, something does happen when I switch vessels to it. 
But let's get this done now. Time to get this thing into orbit. We're all connected up with everything we could want to be connected up to. It says no connection, but that's just because of time warping. Okay. But now it's not showing me a happy encounter with the moon. <sighs> I'm just gonna deal with it and see what how it is once we get in there. Up, oh, see, it fixed itself again. Best not to fill around with it when it uh, messes around like that. Okay, I'll have to skip recording over this little gap here, otherwise we're gonna have issues. Okay, here we are, and interestingly, we see an extra drain on our batteries. So, where is the sun? We're pointing pretty much directly at the sun. There is, there are some things I can turn off, I think. Where is my, ah yes, uh, there's one always on antenna that needs to be turned off. Be opposite that one. Right, that one. Oh, it wasn't even activated. Psh, okay. So forget that. Why does the Pratchett station seem to have six of these solar panels? Why does it only have four? I guess I only put it on four-way symmetry. Should have gotten six. I. I misjudged that. 84 days. Well, the priority is to make sure to com communicate with anything around the moon. So, we need the AIES antenna that we first put out there to remain out. This is the one I can deactivate for now. Because it's a huge power drain and it's not necessary for these sorts of, uh, for the lunar missions. Where is our AIES antenna? This one. So this one is an omni antenna that will cover 10,000 kilometers. So that's, that's more than enough to cover what we can cover around the moon. Okay, so let's get into lunar orbit. Lunar orbit. Now, will I have communication when I'm on at my periapsis? Sort of depends on how the inclination shapes up. Might not. That might be covered by the moon. Probably will be covered by the moon. So I'll, I might have to do a less than optimal thing where I burn into orbit on my outward side. We'll see. But for now, this looks fine. So I've got communication now. I'll have communication up to here. Let's see how much of a difference it would be if I burn to orbit, instead of burning it here, do it while I'm still in communication here. Well, let's do this first just so that we can be sure to get into orbit. I'll tolerate a periapsis of 500. This way we'll be sure to get into orbit instead of hoping that we'll get communication back. So, 1.2 second delay. And actually this is the point where I absolutely have to use flight computer. Okay, node me flight computer. Okay, I'm gonna type in three, 342 meters per second. I will allow full throttle because I have no choice with this rocket. 
And we'll try and use this stage if possible. It says it's very stable right now. But who knows where I'll be in 20 minutes. Part of the reason it's very stable is because we've been... We're using the RCS to move around. We've used a lot of RCS thrust already. Actually, I'm not entirely happy with like computer whoops, just spraying RCS all over the place. Okay, well, flight computer's just gonna have to deal with the tiny little reaction wheel we've got now. Alright, so 20 minutes. Okay, still very stable. Alright. Uh, 341.6. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll amend that then. It was, it's because it did that, after I time warped it did a little 0.4 meter per second thrust. Like it does, for some reason. Here we go. Gonna have zero throttle set just so I can execute that in case something happens. Okay, that's acceptable. We still got uh, we still got juice in this stage. So let's wait until we get to our new periapsis here. And I think we should aim for a tighter orbital period. One day is quite a lot. Well, it would give very nice coverage. But let's not do that right now. Let's say, let's go Kerbin with it and say six hours. So there'll be three hours between peri. Well, right now we're over here. How far are we from periapsis? An hour. Uh, Fifty-five minutes. So three hours and fifty-five minutes. And we'll make it elongated like this, that's fine. Okay, that's close enough for me at this point. So, it's slowly taking us to the node. Gonna type in 217. Ah, ha ha ha. I'll say 217 seconds. 217 meters per second. Uh, landing a probe with, I mean, landing with a manned mission with a one second delay is nothing, right? Because, of course, we've got the Kerbals in and they can control everything. Landing uh, an unmanned mission with a one second delay, that's a different story altogether. Oh, there's Earth, and there's the moon. Okay, well, I guess we time warp to our... So we're uh, saying bye-bye to the Earth for a sec as we... as we'll get covered by the moon. And we'll probably lose communication, yes. And just as Earth appears over the horizon, we get communication back. Stellar. Okay. Still very stable on this stage. So, this is a new thing. The Forseti can not only boost two tons to... What is Flight Computer doing? Anyway, uh, the Forseti can not only boost two tons towards the moon, it can also bring those two tons into orbit around the moon. 
noted for future reference. I mean, that's assuming the relight stuff... Oh, now it's very unstable. Oh, thanks. Okay, um, let me wait a little bit to make it stable. We're still eight minutes from the node. Okay, around here. Let's see. Still very unstable. Okay. I'm going to activate RCS. Try and use RCS thrust. Directly. Okay, that works. Okay, good. That settled things down nicely. And But we're a little bit early. Let's see how long that lasts when I've settled it down like this. Okay. Seems like it's still good. RCS I'll turn off. And let's go for this burn. Alright, so the burn is done. We have a slightly quicker orbital period than I wanted, but I guess it's fine. Shall we just wish? I wish there was a option here called Sun, so we could just point at the Sun directly. But what direction would this be? Positive normal, is it? Let's see. No, no, it's positive radial. Let me make sure that this is not programmed for any further burns. So I'm going to keep this third stage attached since it's still got so much delta V and could potentially help with further boosts and such. And we have our first permanent satellite around the moon. Let's see about doing some science. I don't know if uh, we're over anything interesting. Moon's Highlands. Uh, oh, we're high over. Oh, I guess we won't be getting low over anything, huh? This is too high. Oh well. Let's just quickly make a circuit of the moon. So this is pointing at the sun, right? More or less. At least flight computers should be happy with it. Let's say we go a little bit further. Try this out. Of course, every time I do that, it'll change my orbit slightly. Nope. Island still. Impossible to tell now because I don't have a custom biome configuration for the moon. By the way, accessing the scientific instruments I think is also on the delay. So there's a one second delay before I get this message. I think. Okay, well, I'm not going to waste time right now. Uh, it's already been a long episode. We've gotten our first permanent satellite around the moon and we'll look forward to fleshing out our communication abilities with the moon in the next episode. So, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.